Good morning on this Sunday, April 26th, and welcome to the Georgia Gang. From President Trump to health officials to Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, they all agree Governor Kemp's move to reopen Georgia is too much too soon. As Georgia lawmakers talk about restarting the legislative session in June, they could be looking at a $4 billion shortfall. And Atlanta Public Schools names a finalist for superintendent. We're all keeping a safe distance here. Theron, Phil, Janelle, and Kathy are all joining us from their homes. The debate and discussion begin right now. From the Fox 5 studios, the Georgia Gang starts now. Governor Brian Kemp defends his move to open up businesses across the state as President Trump doubles down on his criticism of that decision. Would I do that? No, I'd keep him a little longer. I want to protect people's lives, but I'm going to let him make his decision. But I told him I totally disagree. President Trump is at odds with Governor Brian Kemp over his decision to loosen restrictions on Georgia businesses as the numbers of coronavirus cases continue to rise across the state. The governor is justifying his decision to open gyms, nail salons, tattoo parlors and bowling alleys on Friday, movie theaters and restaurants tomorrow. Kemp is advising businesses to open with protections in place like social distancing and screening employees for any signs of illness. Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottom says she was shocked to hear about Kemp's decision a decision she learned about with the rest of Georgia during Kemp's news conference. The governor and I have had a long-standing, very good working relationship, uh, but this is something that we will just have to agree to disagree on. But our camp says he's doing what's right for Georgia. So, Phil, I want to start with you. On Thursday evening, I heard President Trump say four times during his news conference that he wasn't happy with Brian Kemp. Were you surprised about the governor's decision? I knew that uh, the governor wanted to reopen Georgia and start uh, getting people back to work. He's always made that theme. Of course, he wants to make sure that uh, health guidelines are, are followed. This is a case uh, between the White House and Governor Kemp of two respected national experts. You have President Trump listening to Dr. Deborah Birx, and she's saying, wait a minute, you know, I don't agree with all of what George is doing, and the president agreed with her. On the other hand, uh, the governor is listening listening to a very respected, nationally recognized epidemiologist, uh, Dr. Kathleen Toomey, who's saying we can do this. And so uh, if the governor is right, he's going to be hailed down the road for reopening the economy and stopping the horrible uh, unemployment rate. And uh, if the curve uh, flattens and goes down, uh, he'll be a hero. If not, he's going to have to regroup. That's a really good point, Theron. You know, I never thought I'd see the day when so many Democrats agreed with the president, including Mayor Bottoms, who I thought, you know, came out really strong giving several national interviews and saying things like bowling just isn't essential. Yeah, you saw not only Democrats, you saw some Republicans come out as well and sort of express their concerns with the governor's decision. And listen, the mayor went on national media and local media, and one thing that she did say is that her and Governor Kim, they do have a good working relationship, but they just simply disagree on this one. But I want to pick up on something that Phil said, because that was going to be my main point here, is that, you know, at a time when we disagree with what the governor is doing, particularly me, uh, I do think that it's a battle of medical opinions. I mean, at the end of the day, it's Dr. Burke and Dr. Fauci against Dr. Toomey. And also you have Dr. Del Rio here in Georgia as well, who's disagreeing with the governor's strategy. And so at the end of the day, I mean, we got to really figure out who's right. And if Dr. Toomey is the medical expert that Governor Kemp is listening to, then provide us with that data. Uh, you know, tell us the metrics that you're using because we've seen inconsistent numbers and inconsistent models which the governor has sort of expressed that he was concerned about. And so I just want to encourage everyone to use common sense. I'm going to stay home. I'm not going to go out. I will gradually sort of evolve back into a normalcy, which will be a new norm. But I just want to encourage everyone to use common sense. And if you don't have to go to a bowling alley, I'm not trying to get any tattoos any sooner. And yes, Phil, I'm going to cut my own hair for another few weeks. Um, let's just use common sense, Georgia. <laughs> Phil's not getting any tattoos anytime soon either, I take it. Janelle, I want to I go to you. That's good news. I read a lot of your <laughs> social media posts because you believe really, like Theron said, this is a personal decision. If, if you don't feel safe going out, well, you can stay home. But my question is, what about employees at restaurants and nail salons and bowling alleys who may not feel safe? Or maybe they have loved ones who are home who may be at high risk, and now they have to report to work or risk losing their jobs. 
Yeah, well, employees and, and, and those individuals have a choice as well. They don't have to go either. I mean, I know Commissioner Butler made it clear that you won't lose your unemployment benefits and then you have to kind of work that out with your employer um, going forward. But I want to make sure that we remind people that the sheltering, sheltering in place was not the first form of mediation. Uh, mediation. That was uh, the 15 day guideline was the first form, which means that if we had followed that, we may not have went into the whole sheltering in place process. And I also want to make sure that I caution people to understanding that numbers are going to continue to rise because we're increasing testing. When it comes to looking at whether or not this is actually working, we need to look for hot spots. Meaning is there going to be a number of people contracting the, the disease around areas where hair salons, barbershops, and tattoo parlors exist? And if we don't see any of those, then it shows that, that we are doing fine and those businesses are following the guidelines. And let's make, be clear that the best case study for this is the Amazon warehouse. Amazon never shut down. They actually employed more people and they actually had people working longer hours and it never became a hot spot because they were following the basic guidelines. So I know sheltering in place feels more comfortable, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the right thing. And for everyone who says that, you know, dead people can't go to work, well, guess what? Alive people won't have anything to come home to. So unless you're anticipating that everyone's going to die, we have to start working on it opening up this economy. Kathy, I know um, that you strongly disagree with Kemp's decision, so let's talk about that. You can open up the economy, but is this, like Trump said, President Trump said, is this too soon? But I want to ask you, and kind of play devil's advocate too, which I like to do with all of you, what about in some parts of rural <laughs> Georgia that only have a few reported cases? I mean, why not allow people to open up their businesses under the guidelines and let people make their own decisions? Well, listen, first, there have been pretty lax enforcement to begin with. So my guess is is that if people have wanted to keep their businesses open, they've kept them open uh, as long as they could get their employees to come to work and it was worthwhile to be open. Where I think, you know, the governor is clearly not taking any medical advice. He, he has not listened to public health from the beginning of this. Kathleen Toomey, to perfect, she's just been eviscerated. She's not saying anything. She's not doing anything but agreeing with him. And public health officials all over the country have said it's too early. We have not hit the peak yet, you know, and, and you've still got to come down the hill before. So he's played a, a big risk. But... What I thought was crazy about this announcement, and there were a lot of things I thought were crazy, is he didn't reach out to his task force. He didn't reach out to other political leaders. He didn't reach out to business owners. He didn't reach out to chambers of commerce to say, how, how are we going to stage this opening? So you can tell people that they can open their business, but if they can't get you know, hand sanitizers, if they can't get masks, if they can't get the things that they need to do this safely, You've really sort of either been incredibly reckless about telling people to open, or you've led people to think that there's an opportunity to open, but you've deprived them of the things that they need to keep both the public and their employees safe. Phil, what do you think about Kathy's take on this? I mean, why didn't he consult with his task force, if that is the case? Um, he didn't talk to a lot of the mayors across Georgia. Is this more of a communication issue also? Well, I, I, I do think uh, my liberal pal Kathy gets a little too shrill here. I, I'm upset to hear her try to attack uh, uh, a, a very respected epidemiologist, Kathleen Toomey, like that. She's been in con contact with the governor, and there's no no one's throttling her. But there is some communications that could be do be that could be done better, Lori. I would agree with that. I think everybody would agree with that. I think the governor is going to speak again on Monday, and I think he's going to uh, make some points clearer than he did. On on Thursday and Friday. That is that the new executive order and, and that, that people ought to be following these guidelines. You know, a lot of people forget, and the media doesn't emphasize this, he never shut down most retail outlets in the state of Georgia. Most people sensibly just said, we're, we're going to close on our own. He did open up some of the things we've been discussing, but these are baby steps, and actually the president and the governor uh, are in agreement on this. In fact, Colorado, which has a Democrat governor, you never hear anything about this, is basically going the same way as Georgia. You can't have a one-size-fits-all, and except for the Albany area and maybe parts of Atlanta, we may be in pretty good shape when it comes to flattening and lowering our virus curve. I'm getting the wrap, but Theron, I do want to get your take on that, because that was a question that I had. That Colorado, the governor there, is doing some similar measures, and is it because he's a Democratic governor that, you know, Georgia's, you know, taking the spotlight on all of this? Like, why do you think that is? 
I think we got to take partisan politics out of it. At the end of the day, I don't know what's going on in Colorado. I care about Georgia. And I think that the problem is, is that you saw just such a reaction from the mayors and the local people. But one of the things I want to also emphasize as well, Lori, is that we cannot forget about the racial and social economic impact that this virus is happening uh, having on people of Georgia. So let's not underscore that. I want to encourage the governor and his task force to make sure that we have the right messenger to really communicate to black, brown, and poor people that this is uh, uh, affecting. I mean, we know that African Americans are dying at a disproportionate higher rate than any other race because of this virus. And so I want to encourage him to, if he comes out on Monday, to really have a focus on the social economic impact that this virus is having on us in Georgia. All right, thank you, Theron. Well, coming up, the coronavirus pandemic takes its toll on the state budget. Why will some lawmakers will have some really tough decisions to make when they return to finish up this year's session? Straight ahead. Have a question or comment for the Georgia Gang? Email them at georgiagang at foxtv.com. Georgia lawmakers are considering a return for the legislative session in June. How that will look, we don't know yet. Theron, I want to start with you. Any word on whether lawmakers will return in person or will this be a virtual session? And, I mean, can they tackle these budget issues without some sort of bailout from the federal government? Well, constitutionally, Lori, they have to pass a budget. And yes, they need a lot of assistance from the federal government uh, to do so. Uh, you saw Speaker Ralston come out this week sort of saying that he's aiming at June 11th as a date for the session to sort of reconvene. It hasn't been clearly stated yet whether uh, or not it's going to be virtual or in person. I think personally it will be a combination of both. Um, sort of people who have to be at the Capitol, then they'll figure out a way to do it. But if you don't have to be there, there'll definitely be a virtual component to this. And so a lot of people are saying, too, that's why you saw this governor and the speaker and lieutenant governor come together, because they understand that state revenue is hurting right now. And that is probably one of the reasons why the governor wanted to focus on small business and reopening. But trust me, they are doing everything they can to communicate, to figure out the safest way to uh, reconvene and end this session. Janelle, I want to ask you, uh, we heard Senator Mitch McConnell say this week that, you know, maybe some states should just go bankrupt. Um, you know, Georgia has to balance the budget constitutionally. That's what's in, you know, in the Constitution. What do you think about a federal bailout for the states? <laughs> I think we, I think all the states are going to be looking at some some form of a bailout. But I also want to commend our governor. I mean, he has taken action on as calling for the budget cuts um, for the departments. And he took a lot of heat for that. Um, and if you notice, he's made a lot of decisions that have shown that he's not scared. Um, he's totally fine with going out there. But I think now we see why it's important to have um, the budget cuts and have a, a rainy day fund because you just never know what's going to happen. Uh, but I do think that every state is going to need some form of a bailout. But this goes back to why we have to, you know, get uh, people back to work because we are right now we're looking at 10% of the population is filed for unemployment. That is that is actually really really high. So um, you know, and 277 million dollars have been paid out within the last four weeks in, in unemployment benefits. So at some point, we're all definitely probably going to need some type of a bailout. Yeah, Kathy, lawmakers were already making cuts to the budget, as Janelle said, and some are saying they may need to cut another four billion dollars. Where? Well, that's the problem, and and let's let's remember this. This is the governor that in January proposed cutting ten million dollars out of the public health budget. Well, we're going to need ten times that in the public health budget going forward. So we've got to think about a, a number of things. One, this governor is going to have to come forward and say what his priorities are. The House passed a budget that is pointless. You know that budget is in the trash can. Now it's over to the Senate, and they're going to have to bring forward a totally new budget, and it's going to be weird because it, you don't sort of start at the midpoint with a completely new budget and then they've got to do it virtually. So that's a problem. Second thing that's a problem is that we passed a, cap, a constitutional cap at 6% on our income taxes. So they can't raise taxes because the Republicans thought it was a good idea to place handcuffs on themselves uh, that, that is now coming home to roost in this recession, which is what everybody told them. So the governor is really going to have to lay out what his priorities are. Half of our budget goes to public education. Um, you know, so this is going to trickle down and then it's going to impact people at the local level through property taxes. So there's a, there's a sequence to everything. There's 
a consequence to every policy decision that you make. Public policy matters, and unfortunately, we don't have Jack Hill at the helm in appropriations helping guide this conversation. So this is a, a dire time, and I hope people pay attention, and I hope people vote in the primaries, because you may just need to replace some of the folks that are there in your own party. Phil, I want to switch gears because it looks like another first in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. The Atlanta Press Club will be doing virtual debates. How will this format help or hurt the candidates? Well, I think debates are always helpful for both the candidates and also for the uh, electorate. And so I commend the press club. I would like to uh, just comment quickly, though. Uh, Kathy's starting to make sense. Uh, she made some good points. So we do have to have the legislature open. I did like what the U.S. House of Representatives did the other day. You know, they, they went alphabetically with their lawmakers. They had five file in at first, uh, socially distancing. Then they voted. Then the next five came in, et cetera. I thought that was a good model. Maybe we could use for the General Assembly. That's a good, good piece of advice there. Th mm -hmm. Theron, what do you think about these virtual debates? I want to go back to that subject. Um, do you think people will be tuning in? Because, I mean, is the election on people's minds right now? Well, what you're going to see, Lori, is that the Atlanta Press Club has done an outstanding job over the years of making sure that they promote these debates. And so I think they're going to ask the candidates, and I think the candidates are going to proactively make sure that they activate their networks to encourage people to tune in. And so it's definitely going to be difficult as far as how you rebut. I mean, look at what we're going through here with our panel. You know, it's very sort of difficult to jump in when Phil is sort of giving fake news every now and then. But um, the one thing I think it's also going to do is that it's going to really allow the candidates to really use uh, innovative ways to get their message out. You'll probably see a lot of props. You'll see them use a lot of sort of memorable taglines and different things. But I think the sort of rebutting and sort of the uh, back and forth is going to be difficult to do virtually. It, I can attest it really is difficult to do. So thank you all. Well, coming up, Atlanta schools pick a finalist to replace Superintendent Maria Karstarfen. We'll discuss straight ahead. Join the discussion on the Georgia Gang Facebook page and watch past episodes on the Georgia Gang YouTube channel. Lisa Herring, she's the top pick to replace Maria Karstarfen as the superintendent of Atlanta Public Schools. Phil and then Theron, we'll start with you guys. She has a really impressive resume, a Spelman grad. She's from Macon, spent time in Bibb and DeKalb County Schools. And she most recently is the superintendent of Birmingham City Schools in Alabama. Phil, your thoughts? Well, I'm going to try to be the optimist here. I uh, wish her well, as I'm sure everybody does. Uh, I think um, Superintendent Karstarfen has done a good job, even though she was uh, controversial. We had some uh, test scores that uh, went up uh, in, in areas that surprised people, and that was welcomed. And we also uh, had higher graduation rates. She closed some non-performing schools. And so there is a model to follow. I think the new superintendent uh, needs to understand that the key is communication with the school board and that was a weakness with Superintendent Karstarfen. Farron. Yeah, Lori, I want to first disclose that I'm assisting the board with the onboarding process of Dr. Uh, Nelson, so I want to make sure, I'm sorry, Dr. Herring, uh, Lisa Nelson, um, uh, um, sorry, I'm assisting the board with the onboarding of this process with Dr. Herring, and I want to start by that, but I think Phil is right. Uh, this is all about collaboration. Uh, she has 25 years of experience in education. Uh, she's already sort of reaching out to different people uh, across party lines and different uh, community leaders, parents, and et cetera. But the one thing I want to emphasize, if you really look at a brief Q&A that she participated in, she said one of her top priorities is to make sure that every APS student, every APS parent, faculty, and staff feel supported through this COVID-19 process. And so she's already sort of making sure that when school starts back, whenever that is, that all of the people that are involved feel supported by her. All right, Janelle, let's uh, talk about the story that keeps on giving. State Rep Vernon Jones. <laughs> now he's an avid Trump supporter. Yeah. <laughs> he said he was going to resign from his position because of all the criticism he got from the announcement, but a day later he changed his mind. What do you think about all of this? Well, I think his initial response was a bit premature, but here's the thing, right? I cannot imagine being a conservative on the Democratic side. I, I would want to quit every day as well, so I totally get him on that. 
But I want to say, though, as a minority who's on the Republican side here, um, that, you know, I, I know you hear a lot of negative opinions and a lot of, a lot of negative comments that come at you, things you hear about from, from behind your back, things you hear face to face. And the biggest thing is that sometimes less is more. You know, you don't have to address everything. And I think he's going to learn that over time um, as he continues to go on. But I also think that he is really um, in a tough position. But I think he should just stay the course. Less is more. And just don't, you know, don't have to address everything. Kathy, we'll switch gears again. Another tough week for Fulton County DA Paul Howard. The AJC is reporting more claims of sexual harassment against him, this time in a lawsuit filed by a long-term paralegal and record supervisor. Now, according to the AJC, the woman, Kathy Carter, claims she had several sexual encounters with Howard and was fired after she ended their unofficial relationship. But Howard's office says she was fired because she was arrested for assault in Clayton County. It's not a great day to be Paul Howard, I have to say. I, I can't imagine running in this uh, election term and, and be facing the number of charges that he's facing right now. Only time will tell. Everything's going to have to get sorted out through courts and processes. Uh, but um, it, you know, hasn't been a great month for him. Still, you know, Howard is up for re-election. We know the State Ethics Commission is looking into him, but voters have put him in office since 1997. That's right, but uh, he's facing uh, the, the most toughest political challenge of his of his political life. He's got two candidates in the June 9th Democratic primary. They're hammering him, and rightly so. These are very serious uh, sexual harassment allegations, just the latest in the string of them. And uh, of course, then the Ethics Committee is looking at this uh, shady entity that where he was getting money from that uh, isn't allowed by state law. So that's going to be hashed out in court. So he's uh, playing defense. All right. Well, coming up, we will have winners and losers. Stay tuned, everyone. Time now for the week's winners and losers. Hey, gang, you can take your time today. We have four minutes for winners and losers. And Phil, we'll start with you. Well, thank you, Lori. In the context of, um, of public health and safety, uh, we also have to balance that, of course, with uh, reopening parts of the economy and getting jobs. So I want to make as a winner Billy Corey uh, of the Corey Companies. You see this big tower if you're in downtown Atlanta, and uh, it's got an electric sign on there. And he, the other day he had, uh, let's support the truckers. And it's a reminder that uh, this is a key economic lifeline, not just for Georgia, but for America. So I thought that was a great reminder by Billy Corey. And you know, my loser has got to be the disgraceful contact, conduct of the, uh, the White House press corps. Uh, and the Atlanta Constitution hadn't been any better with their liberal slants and anti-Trump slants. Those correspondents have been so rude and, and uh, vicious with uh, slanted questions. It's not a debating society. I've been a journalist most of my career, and I'm ashamed of what some of those journalists are doing at those press conferences. All right, Baron, we'll go over to you. Yeah, I want to echo what, what Phil said. I just want to encourage everyone to stay safe and use common sense. Um, this is a process. Let's not go out and do anything that's going to harm ourselves or anyone else. But um, also, my uh, winner is going to be Senator Blake Tillery out of Bowdell, Georgia. Uh, he's a Republican senator who is stepping in, was chosen to be appropriations chair in the Senate to succeed the late uh, Jack Hill. So definitely want to wish him well and, and give him a lot of support as he has a very hard task ahead of him. And then lastly, I want to make a winner, uh, outgoing Department of Watershed Commissioner Keisha Powell, uh, who resigned this week, who announced that she's taking a, a new job in D.C. water. So definitely want to thank her for her years of service and wish her well. All right, Kathy, over to you. Well, I'm... Um kind of focused on the losers right now. The double loser is Vernon Jones because apparently he actually submitted the paperwork to have his name removed from the ballot and I'm not sure he can put it back on. So we're gonna call him a double loser this week for not only pitching a fit in public but then carrying through with it and uh, now he's trying to get back. Um, my other loser, and I want to say it again, is, is Dr. Kathleen Toomey. I think she really needs to learn how to speak truth to power. Remember, she sat in a hearing on the House side and said her department could make do with the $10 million cut to public health, and she's still not telling the governor news he doesn't want to hear. And I think it's really important uh, for her to understand that she has got to be a leader and say what she thinks. Um, and, and similarly with the governor, you know, experience matters. We've got somebody who's governor who doesn't really understand how to use government to move things forward, and I hope he'll be more communicative. I know I got to wrap. My winner, surprise, surprise, Mark Butler, 
thanks to him for getting out there out front because the governor didn't call him and clarifying what people on unemployment can expect in this new scenario. All right, and Janelle. All right, well, talk about saying, telling people how you feel, right? Um, but <laughs> my winner is uh, Karen Park. Uh, she is, and shout out to her. Um, she's a viewer of the show, and this is on behalf of your son, Lee. Um, so special shout out to you. And then also my winner is CEO Michael Thurman. And the reason why I made him my winner is because I know that people have their personal hesitation, that he has his own personal hesitation as it relates to the reopening. But instead of encouraging people to just shelter in place, which is their right, which has not been taken away from them, he's using his platform to encourage businesses to just go a step beyond the guidelines if necessary to make sure your business are sanitized if you choose to open up as well as if you choose to stay at home that's fine but he's not using his platform to just encourage people just to sit at home um, and then my loser this week are it, all those people who are protesting to um, out that are not sheltering in place while they protest in order to tell people that they should shelter in place. I just think that's a little bit loony. All right, I just have one winner that I can squeeze in. It's Charity Sailors, the owner of Smyrna Restaurant Vittles, because she sold her car so she could pay her employees and cover the rent. Lots of hometown heroes riding this through. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we will see you back here next week.